Sado is with me every moment. Mm. He's in my heart. It is, it is, he's a part of my, my, my DNA, mm. my understanding of the world. That will never go away. Mm. So welcome back to Lex Reads. So I am so excited about this. As you can see from the title, I read From Scratch by Tim B. Locke. I jumped on the bandwagon and I had to read From Scratch by Tim B. Locke. But what I did is I actually was watching like the first three episodes. I said, you know what? I'm gonna pause it. I want to read the book first. And I'm so glad I did. I devoured this in like, what, three or four days. I could not stop reading this. And the fact that this is nonfiction, usually I don't really do nonfiction, but for this, fantastic. I actually grew up watching Timby Locke. If you are a kid from the 90s, <laughs> um, like I was, that's when her career started to really blossom. And she would do guest stars on like the Wayne's Brothers, uh, Jamie Foxx show, Hager Musa Cooper, uh, Fresh Prince of Bel Air. I mean, girl, I've watched so much of her works, and when I tell you she's a fantastic actress, so I grew up watching Tim B. Locke, okay. Um, and I uh posted uh my reaction on Instagram, and she actually liked it, so I was like having a whole fangirl moment. Um, but you guys read this book. And then, of course, we have all watched the limited series and they did that. The fact that her and her sister created that, just amazing. Those are just two, those are two pioneer women, okay? Like Timby Locke and Attica Locke. I want to be them when I grow up. Um, and then this love story, she had a true love story. And I had so many emotions when I read this book. I had, you know, happy, sad, joyous, just everything. And I stated before, and you'll see throughout the video, but um, I love how she depicted childhood grief. And grief is something I can clearly relate to, everyone can relate to. Um, but for me, I experience, uh, have experienced grief as an adult and as a child. Um, you know, I lost my mom when I was uh, eight years old. And then um, when I was in my 20s, my grandmother, my aunt, my uncle, those are the people that raised me and they all passed within a year and it was difficult, okay? One way that I dealt with my grief was to actually get back into reading. Reading has helped me and my faith has helped me tremendously. Um, and I always tell people, you know, if you are grieving, you know, maybe start reading, pick up a book because it worked for me, um, you know, and it was a way for me to just escape. Uh, so I think that's one reason why this book is so special to me and it means so much to me because it is talking about grief um, and it's talking about grief in a different way. Um, like I say that you mentioned childhood grief and I can fully relate to that, okay? Because uh, I literally was like just a year older than her daughter, Zoella, when, um, you know, her dad died. Please read this. Read this. This is, look, y'all got to come and get one of these, okay? Please read it, all right? So yeah, guys, that's it. You will see my reaction. So I am starting from scratch by Tim B. Locke. Um, Lord. <laughs> I watched the first three episodes of um, clearly the Netflix series. And I'm like, I'm going to finish it. Um, but I said, you know what? I want to read the book and then finish the series. And when I tell you, I've already started to cry. Um, also, I have been watching interviews uh, with Tim B. Locke. Like I said it before, I actually grew up watching Tim B. Locke. It's so crazy because I remember when this book came out, I remember like her face looked familiar and I was like, oh, that's that black actress. And I remember her from an episode of 
the Wayne's brothers I was obsessed with that show when I was younger I had no business watching it but I was obsessed with that show and she was on the episode where um she was supposed to be like Pops's daughter and then um that's like the main show that I do remember her from so of course like with me I research everything if I like a person I will like you know go on this rabbit hole of uh, you know watching interviews looking at pictures and everything so that's exactly what I did with Miss Timby Locke and I have watched an episode of her on the Jamie Foxx show in the house um let's see Eve um you remember Eve had the rapper she had a show uh the Bernie Mac show what else Oh, and then she was on a show called Eureka. So what I've been doing is um, <laughs> I have been like every scene that she's in, I like I like fast forward and every scene she's in, I watch it. And then when she's not in the scene, I like fast forward again to see her again. Lord. Um, so I've been watching that kind of. Um, and then also another movie that she was in, I watched it in college and it's called Un Unbowed, I think. Um, it's about a historical black college. They, um, they invite and let, um, I think Native Americans, um, come to their school and it has Michelle, who is it? Michelle Thomas, that's her name. She was Justine from, uh, the Cosby show. She was the old girlfriend and she was on Family Matters, um, but she was in it. That was like her last movie that was, she was in. So they dedicated the movie to her. But Timby was in that movie. And I remember watching that in uh, college. It was some course. Probably, I think it had to be a sociology course. Because that's what I majored in. Um, but I remember, you know, seeing that. So, like I said, I grew up watching Timby Lock, okay. Um, but I can, like, kick myself because I should have read this. And um, back in 2019, and I've talked about it also before, where um, when I was grieving, a way for me to get through it was um, by books. I had, you know, was never a reader, and I got back into reading as a way to grieve, and it has helped tremendously, okay? Because um, losing my mom at, you know, eight years old, and then fast forward, I lost my aunt in November 2017 my grandmother February 2018 my uncle December 2018 so and those are like you know my nuclear family you know people that raised me so the fact that you know if I would go to my aunt and then if I got sick of my aunt, I would go to my grandmother. I got sick of my grandmother, I'd go to my uncle. And, you know, it was just that pattern. And now not being able to do that, it is difficult. It still is difficult. Um, but like I said, my faith and, you know, books really got me through it. And it's still getting me through it. So I know this is going to be a hard read for me. Um, I've already teared up. And Girl. yeah. The fact that this is Timby Locke's debut novel, it does not read like a debut novel. This girl knows how to write. You hear me? And I'm not a, just a big fan of nonfiction. I prefer fiction. Um, but this year I have read uh, about four or five. Uh, so I'm getting out of my comfort zone. And already this is probably going to be in my, my top 10. Okay. And, and I also love Timby Locke's speaking voice. It's so pretty. And she actually narrates her own book. Um, so, so far I have cried. The way that she describes her late husband Sato is just remarkable. Like I keep on saying, Timby can write. Okay. Um, so backstory, Timby is a... 20 year old college student she is an art history major and she goes to italy and she goes there you know supposed to go there for a semester you know focus on school and all of that so she literally bumps into sato bumps into him um and she's like you know he a nice guy but i'm not really looking for anything like i gotta i'm here for school but little does she know <laughs> the way that he just Oh, Sato, girl, let me read you what she said about him. It was so funny. I love this. 
subtle and, and all his ease, openness, and attractiveness was not the kind of guy I went for, stateside or, or in Italy. He seemed way too available, way too nice. My kind of attractive was aloof, non-committal, and definitely hard to catch. After having had multiple on-campus affairs that had gone nowhere fast, I wasn't looking for anything serious. I needed to focus on school, not man, but that was easier said than done. Oh, so yeah, like she, you know, her thing, I gotta focus on school, but not, not with Sato. And then one scene that I love, and she says, you know, everyone talks about it is they had an arrangement, you know, they started going together and they had this arrangement where he, um, you know, the doorbell was broken and also to the den mother where she was like staying you know she didn't want all them pesky boyfriends and all that waking her up at night so what their arrangement was after he would get out of work because he was an italian chef he would wait under like the lamp post and she would you know look out and see him and then she would let him in and one night she fell hard asleep it, let me just read it to you when I got to the window, flush with anxious nerves, the first thing I saw was that it was pouring raining. Could this be any worse? As I peered out into the night and looked down, there he was, my Sato. His coat was drawn tight. His hair was a wet soaking mess. He was looking up at the window of our apartment. One look at Sato and something new about him came into focus. This man, this chef was showing me who he was deep down the persistence of his character oh my goodness like what he literally stood in the rain for that girl okay he was in love he was in love oh my goodness girl i want a man like sato she the way she writes this book you it's like girl sato is my man okay <laughs> she makes you fall in love with him like that's the kind of man you want and he can cook girl let me read you the passage of uh, Sato's transition uh, because that just, oh my goodness, it got me. It says, I took the 40 steps from my bedroom to the hospice room. When I pulled back the pocket door, his face was looking towards the door. He was staring straight at me. I could hear what I knew was his final shallow breaths. Oh, my love. I crawled into bed with him. A single tear had formed in his eye. I am sorry I made you wait. I fell asleep, but I am here now. I am here. He had waited for me to be at his side. I kissed his tears away. Then there was only a few more breaths. They were shallow, faint, then faded into nothing as I laid beside him. I was breathing in new air, air in which he was gone. He had waited for me the same way he had waited for me in Florence, standing by the lamp posts in the in the winter rain. Yeah. But yeah, she she really I'm so glad that she included um, you know, um Sato's transition because she said at one point she didn't know if she was gonna include that or not. And I like I said, I'm so glad that she did. This was the moment it had arrived. Sato, go easy on me. Please, honey, make this easy for me. Over the next six hours, as night pushed into morning, I sat at his bedside. I had kissed his hand. You have been an incredible partner, an incredible father. You have honored my life. I will love you for all eternity. It is okay to go, my love. I spoke softly into his ear. I felt the warmth of my breath come back to me. This body has served you well, but now you will leave it. I will always welcome you in my dreams and look forward to our next time together. Oh, I love the way to be right. That is just, oh my goodness. And so the night of his passing when he was home, I was caring for him. I had family around and then I needed a break. I needed to just rest my body and I fell asleep. Not unlike the night two decades earlier. And my sister woke me and she said, I think it's time. And we got to share a last moment together.
can appreciate that I love that Timby um, talks about is, you know, when it comes to interracial uh, relationships, it's only framed sometimes from the white person's perspective or like the white people's perspective and not the black, you know, folks perspective. And, you know, it doesn't get as talked about as much. And I love how she incorporated that because her mom, like, her mom brought the real. She was like, you know, <laughs> she almost, well, basically she was calling her like a sellout because uh, she's like, you know, there's no way that you're going to study in Europe and you're you're probably going to get a white man. And clearly she did. Um, and she was like, what did she say? She says, by being here, you are virtually excluding yourself from the possibilities of being with someone who is non-white. But like Timby said, you know, at the end of the day, they wanted her, you know, her to be happy. And the fact that she said, you know, my parents raised me with, you know, to follow my conviction. And that's exactly what she did. Um, but yeah, I, I love how she incorporated that. Because like I said, you don't always see that. And then like, again, she just makes the reader fall in love with Sato like every time he's on the page. Um, so, you know, she was intended on staying in Italy for just a semester. She actually stayed for a year. Um, you know, she goes on and she graduates from college and she's, um, was gonna, she actually stays in Florence, but then, you know, she's getting her acting career, you know, up on the ground and they're like, well, you need to come to New York. And Sato literally is like, well, you know, um, people eat anywhere so I'll follow you that's exactly what he does and then I know also in the series they didn't mention it um but they actually kind of elope um so when they get married in Florence they're they're actually already married um uh, but this part I love it says Sato makes fresh pasta dough delic delicately by hand and that postage stamp size kitchen I came up behind him, looked over his shoulder and said, I think we should get married. In the three days since he had arrived, that was all I could think about. We had talked about it for months, but now that we were living together, the desire had new urgency. He didn't look up. Sure, of course. My asking him to marry me while he was making passages seemed the most natural and logical thing to do. We need, we need it for the INS you need to have permanent permanent residence uh resident status so you can work we can go down to the city hall and then that's exactly what they do and then later on they you know um they get married obviously in uh italy now he hasn't told his parents um about them yeah i mean they know i think okay it says and then in nearly five years that Sado and I have been together, I had barely even so much so much as exchanged hellos with his parents over the phone. Still, it was a surprise for me when I learned that Sado had yet to tell his parents that we were getting married again, this time in Italy. So the fact that, um, you know, background of Sado's, uh, you know, parents is there are Sicilian farmers and the fact that he left uh you know sicily and went on to be a chef and even to study um you know uh poetry in school he kind of like broke that um tradition and his parents could not get like down with that especially his father and then you know when timby came along it was a way it was just another way of him being you know other the fact that she was black and American, um, wanted to be actress, she had divorced parents. That was like a no-no for, you know, like an Italian family. And it was more like, if you guys get divorced, if this doesn't work, it's a shame on the family. It's a shame on our, you know, town. That was the main thing. And then, um, so, you know, he had some other things going on in his family, um, that, you know, at first Timby didn't, um, know about. And then she ended up learning uh, because they did not come to the wedding. Um, they had a beautiful wedding in Italy and his family didn't come to it. Now, he, I think he had two uh, aunt and uncle that came and um, 
that was it but her whole family came from uh texas and it was a beautiful wedding um she said so yeah um and then like two years goes by she says two years and you can see when a partner is holding on to that silent you know like pain and she saw that and she said you know what we we need to go to sicily and what she does is she buys two tickets and she tells him, by the way, we're going to, you know, Sicily. And he's like, what? And she's like, no, we have to go. You're like, you know, I know this is killing you. And her thing is, I, I just want, you know, my husband to at least get some type of, if not closure, but at least try. And her thing is, okay, if they don't accept this, at least that we put, you know, we we did we tried to you know work it out like we tried to actually go and lend you know a hand um so you know they do that and then eventually you know it she gets accepted by the family because they realize oh this woman really loves our son um and they see that and oh i just i i love it and then you know obviously the book it talks it's it talks about you know the past and the present and um in the beginning it's you know her having Sato's ashes and going to Sicily for the first time since he has passed her daughter they go to Sicily to spend time with her mother-in-law and she just builds this beautiful uh bond uh with Nona and it's just it's amazing I love the way you know I love how she describes Sicily like I keep on saying you feel like you are there you feel like you can smell taste touch see everything here um the way she describes it just impeccable but yeah she spends um you know every summer uh you know with her uh with her and her daughter and her uh, mother-in-law and you just you see how it goes and the fact that you know it's so bittersweet because the person that you know brought them all together is no longer there is no longer here Sato um and she said you know one day she just was her daughter was outside playing and her uh mother-in-law you know um was near her and she was outside you know sitting and she was like how in the world did we get here like how in the world and you know she said from her just thinking that and seeing her daughter and the closest of her um her mother-in-law that kind of was like an opening of her to write down the memories and things like that because she said after five years she started writing um and it was a way to you know just cope and even to come closer even to get closer with Sato because Sato was the type of um husband that he wrote letters he wrote poems to her her daughter he was a love of you know uh of poetry so he just was like oh my goodness so special in every way um and the I, you know she said she's so glad that she has like those tangible things you know even with like his uh you know kitchenware and like the letters and things like that notebooks and it's like i cannot stop like gushing over this book and i'm not even done with it i'm like halfway done so you know she goes from past uh, to present and i really like that sometimes in books i don't i don't like it because it's it's like you know i'm just getting you know um engrossed in like you know the past and then it goes the next chapter goes to the present i'm like it was just getting good but with this the way that she navigates it it's perfect like absolutely perfect but i find myself every time when um you know it talks about Sato, especially when he is alive it just I love those, you know, chapters because you just see him even more and you see the love that he has for Timmy. You see the love that they both have for each other. I mean, they truly loved each other. He truly loved her. Um, and you know how they say in relationships where like the man really is supposed to love the woman even more? You see this. Like he just adores Timmy and she adores him too. Um, and you know, their beautiful daughter, the way that she writes the way that he is with his daughter is just so precious like you could tell the short peter a period of time that he had with his daughter he was just an amazing father he honestly was um and timby depicts that i just i you see i'm gushing over Sato. okay i i love this man um 
but yeah, this story is just incredible it is incredible i keep on saying that but it's like there's no other way to describe this wonderful crafted um memoir like i mean timmy did this she did this okay so i'm at one part where um sato is you know he's in the hospital um the cancer has come back and <laughs> they assume that she was like the hired help and her thing is no like that's my husband and she literally had to put on the whiteboard you know and like in the hospital where they have like the name and like who's gonna take care like the nurse and the a nurse's aide she she put wife comma black woman in the corner they just like was so dismissive to her and she said you know i had to claim to be his wife um i didn't need to have that conversation uh, on top of everything else that's going on like you know i'm i'm already dealing with you know his cancer and everything and it's difficult on our family and you know him and it's like i don't need to have that conversation like oh by the way i'm his wife and it is one thing to be saying goodbye to your husband to have a small child that you are caring for and then to also on top of that be dismissed or be invisible or be presumed to be the hired help it is beyond insult to injury and so i i we wanted to put that in the series to be very open and it's not a big moment it's not a long moment it's just a passing moment because it happened tempe was a um caregiver for her husband for 10 years sato was diagnosed with a uh a rare soft tissue cancer and they caught it they had the blessing of catching it early that's why he was able to you know they you know live for the 10 years of having cancer and home health care and caregiving it's a lot um, and it takes a special person to do that so yeah like i was saying with um home health aid and caregiving it does take a special place it does take a special person to do that i actually after college was a home health aide um and i did that for like literally years um and i have worked from i have worked with people that are paraplegics uh mental patients um like nonverbal everything and it can be joyous but it also can be draining and i think uh for me i i loved it, especially when i had older people with like dementia or um you know alzheimer's just talking to them talking to them um that brought comfort and i had uh patients where i just was like a a um basically like a babysitter they just needed someone to be you know with them and i you know i love those too so that's another reason that's another I have so many multiple reasons why I love this book, but that is another reason why I love this book because Timby talks about the the importance of caregiving. And I mean, to have someone helping your family and um, just like I said, caregiving in general, it, it, it's it's a lot. And also too, with home health aides and caregivers, they don't pay them anything. I remember when I first started out with um that, I made what eight dollars and ninety eight cents. The highest I ever got to was about fifteen dollars an hour, um, and I did it like I said, like right after college. Just I didn't, you know, was looking for a job, and I was like, you know what? Let me just do this. Uh, you know, have some, you know, pocket change or whatever. And I did enjoy it. I honestly did. So like again, thumbs up for Timby when she talks about you know caregiving because that's a whole nother <laughs> you know topic um an issue that comes with that so i literally just finished this and just amazing that's all i could say how did you do that like how did you know he was in love he was in love <laughs> and he and i said not only was he in love but then he taught me how to love and then i realized and it was only in the writing of the book i said oh he taught me how to stand in the rain he taught me that that's what love is. And that's what I did for him for 10 years.